Good morning. Welcome to worship today. We had a wonderful Ascension celebration this past Thursday. This coming week is the closing week of school. Please pray for teachers and students as they finish that school year up and embark on the summer. And, and right now we're closing out the Easter season with the seventh Sunday of Easter as we join together in his praise. Please stand, greet one another, remain standing for our opening hymn. Good to see you. Good morning. Hey, Emma. Good morning. How? This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is true. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever.
The New Testament reading is from Acts, the first chapter. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, a keldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias, And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. dwell in unity their lips and lives in one accord they ever sing doxology to Jesus brother shepherd 
Sun's quenching dew from Hermon's height On Zion's holy mountain pours When through the sun his sons unite The living Lord their life restores The epistle reading is from 1 Peter, 4th chapter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, and strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. A gospel reading from John chapter 17. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given to him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one even as we are one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, Lord, I love the habitation of your house. 
and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's be seated. Boys and girls, boy, it's good to see you here in church in this fine morning. All right, here's a question. You ready? Do you know the word graduation? 
That's kind of a big word, a lot of syllables. You've heard that word before. We kind of talk about, it kind of means that you're finished with one part of your life and then you move on to a different part or there's something. Usually it's talking about something with schools, you know? And we have graduation. Just this afternoon, our own Lutheran High School is going to have graduation. And those students are going to move on to college or other parts of their life. And that's pretty exciting. On Thursday of this week, just coming up in a few days, right here at Zion, we're going to have a graduation. Our eighth graders are going to graduate, and they're going to move on to high school. We're going to say goodbye to them. Some have been here for a long time, eight, nine, ten years. Some have been here just one year, and they'll have graduation. Some graduates have graduated from college even and moved on. And they're not, they may move on to another school, but they're kind of just moving on to life. Some of those graduates are sitting right out here in, in our congregation today, and we could almost ask them to come up and help, but we're not going to do that. We'll let them stay there. We'll just congratulate them uh, just a little bit later. So they're going to move on. You know, it kind of makes me think that there's a little bit like this car. Doesn't this car look like, wouldn't it be fun to play with this car with the blue color and the doors open, and we can roll it around and do some things? Well, as when you're your age, you might play with a car like this. When you get a little older, you might play with a car like this. Again, it's a little car. It's a little bit different, a few more parts to it, a little more complicated. There's some different things, but you're still playing with some cars. Yeah, that's a nice one. That is for sure. Well, it's kind of like Jesus. You know Jesus, right? Who can tell me one thing that they know about Jesus? What is it? Fantastic. Yes, he did. She said he died on the cross for our sins. That is exactly right. What else do you know about Jesus? He went up to heaven. Yeah, he did. And we're going to get there. One more. And he rose from the dead. We celebrate that here at Easter time. We get to do all those other things. Well, Jesus came down here and he... And he changed a little bit, or we look at him. When you honor and you follow Jesus right now, we worship him and we pray to him and do that. As you get a little older, you're going to do the same thing. We always follow Jesus. See, in graduation, sometimes we move on to a different school. Sometimes we move on to something different. But with Jesus, we always follow Jesus, no matter how old we are. Even when we get a little bit old. Even when you get a little bit older. You know like Pastor Febercorn and Pastor Roland? When you get a little bit older, you're still learning about Jesus. All the time, there's still things to learn about Jesus. So all these graduations that are going on, we can celebrate this month of May that we do that. Those people are moving on. Things are going to change. But Jesus never changes. And we always follow Jesus no matter what. That's a really important thing to remember. Can we pray with me? Fold your hands, bow your heads. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Help me to always follow you. Amen. Come on up and get a, a sheet from one of us, then you can return to your seats.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Second service in a row that Mr. Debrick has zinged me for age. He mentioned last night that there was little danger in um, making fun of someone who's about to get the microphone for 15 minutes, but um, <laughs> revenge is a dish best served cold, as they say. He can wait. He can wait. I'll endure. I'll endure the suffering. I want to spend a little bit of time today inside of our epistle reading. If you've been keeping score at home, you might have noticed that we have been inside the epistle or letter of 1 Peter, one of Peter's letters to the church for the entire season of Easter. You might happen to recall last week when we focused on it, you heard that that passage was the critical scriptural foundation for what we confess often as Jesus' descent into hell. You might also remember by the helpful slide that was up on the wall that when we talk about Jesus descending into hell, we do not talk about that as part of his suffering. We talk about that as part of his victory, proclamation of his glorious victory of salvation. So this week we're sticking with with 1 Peter, but a slight shift because this week we absolutely are going to talk about suffering. But we are not going to talk about the suffering of Jesus or emphasize the suffering of Jesus on the cross so much as we're going to talk about the suffering that his, of those his suffering has saved. We, his people. I'm going to walk through this passage, so if you wouldn't mind, turn it back to page 9 in your bulletin. One of the things that I hope you hear Peter say today will be a corrective for us that suffering is a part of life. In sharp contrast to the message that many speak and pretend to be the words in the name of Jesus, suffering is a real part of our lives. Take a look first, please, at the top verse. That's verse 12. It goes like this. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Do not be surprised, Peter says. And he starts there, and I wanted to start there because I have some inclination that the words that he says do not be surprised are words that absolutely would surprise many people. Peter begins with this foundational thing. You ought not be surprised, my beloved, when suffering comes upon you as if it was unusual. It is not unusual. Just yesterday morning, I happened to be looking at a site that I read pretty often, and they had pushed to the top an article that was actually old. It was from a couple years ago. But I was glad they pushed the top. It was timely. It was written by a pastor and author who I've tried to read whenever his words come up. He's a a great writer, a great thinker. And he was talking about suffering. He was talking about a personal diagnosis that he had been given. And as you can imagine, a person in his shoes, in my shoes, spent countless hours of ministry trying to talk other people through that moment, trying to comfort other people. And then suddenly it happens. One of the things that he noticed was that even though he had encouraged people over and over again, that he was still shocked because suddenly all of life changes. And he wrote beautifully and honestly and eloquently about the constant battle it was for him. Not a battle with the disease. The constant battle for him was to remind his heart what his head knew. To battle the surprise that he felt and the shock that he felt. To take time each and every day to read God's word and pray God's word and be comforted by God's word. And you see, he did that the same way that Peter does here in our reading, by clinging to the word of God. If you look down at verse 14, you'll see something I thought was kind of interesting. When Peter talks about suffering, he's, He says this, he says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. If you suffer, you are blessed. That might even also remind you of some other words that might be familiar, that even if you mourn, are blessed. It struck me as interesting, this is the second week in a row in our reading from 1 Peter, that Peter quoted an old sermon that he once heard. 
in case you might be remembering what the point of listening to sermons is. Peter here is quoting the famous Sermon on the Mount of Jesus, that people who suffer might look cursed, might feel cursed, but God actually calls them blessed. Now, to be clear and to be fair, the kind of suffering that Peter is primarily talking about in this section is the suffering that comes with persecution. It's the kind of suffering that Peter knew very well and a kind of suffering that you and I know less about. But it might be wise for the church to spend time knowing where the church once was, to know where the church is going. But I want to expand that a little bit today. I want to talk in large part today about the suffering that we experience in body, whether that's our suffering or someone else's suffering. And also, to be fair, those two kinds of suffering, persecution and broken body, they aren't all that different. You and I have enemies and we have tragedies for much the same reason, which is that sin has corrupted this world, has corrupted the bodies of even those who belong to Jesus. It's evidence of a decaying world, a decaying body. It's why the Apostle Paul could write elsewhere about his physical struggle, whatever it was, He could call that thorn in his flesh a persecution, a messenger of Satan, he says. And when you and I bump into that kind of suffering, whether it's persecution or physical struggle, you and I ought to do what Peter does here, which is cling to the words of Jesus. You who suffer, for whatever reason, might look cursed, might feel cursed, I call you blessed. And you can wage that battle of head attempting to remind heart of what you know to be true, pushing against what you feel to be true in this moment by clinging to the word of God. I want you to jump down um, one verse there, verse 15. Take a look at this. Peter says, But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God. Peter's going to offer us another necessary corrective here. People don't like to suffer. That's mostly true. But there are, of course, many people who love to claim victimhood. And against those people, Peter is going to push us, push against a little bit. You see, if you are suffering because of a lengthy series of foolish decisions that you have made, that is not holy martyrdom in glory to God before the world. If you wonder out loud over and over again why it is that you are suffering thusly, And anyone who hears rolls their eyes because of the countless opportunities you have had to change course. That is not the kind of suffering that Peter is talking about today. There is, though, good news for you as well. Which is that you can take that to the suffering Savior and receive his forgiveness. But I do want you to know that on your walk to Calvary... I would encourage you to drop the blame and instead realize the responsibility and come before Jesus, not believing you have been attacked by someone else, but ready to echo the prayer of that tax collector, honest about who he was and what he had done. Have mercy on me, a sinner. The kind of suffering we're talking about today is the kind of suffering that is largely outside of our control. Suffering that seems to attack us. And I want you to know it is critically important that you and I talk about this kind of thing. Because as much time as we spend looking outside of our holy walls at whatever unholy ideology the world is putting forward, whatever new idolatry the world wants to worship, as much time as we spend thinking about those, and as dangerous as those are, and they are, I know plenty of people who have been shaken out of their faith, not by that, but by struggle. That's why the author that I read the other day wrote about it. That's why Peter writes about it. That's why I'm here to talk about it. Because those moments can be earth-shattering. They can be life-shattering. 
But when we cling to the word of God, they ought not be faith-shattering. I know so many people who have bumped into bad news and it all falls apart. Or maybe they even bump into someone who's experiencing bad news themselves and they say to them, how and why? Because they're full of anger in the midst of their storm. And people who have lived in the faith all their lives, they come up short in that moment. They feel like they have nothing to say and so they believe that their faith no longer solves problems and answers questions. And I have to tell you that if those kinds of questions came to me, I would try to be as compassionate and generous as I possibly could, but I would have to remember what it is that they have been believing all along. Because as for me, the core of my faith is at the pinnacle of beauty and joy and grace and life and even the kingdom of God was seen most clearly in the bloody and sweaty mess of Golgotha. Take a look down. We're actually jumping chapters here, so the numbers are going to reset. I'd ask you to look real briefly at verse 7. That's bottom paragraph. Peter says this, Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. How is it that you and I can endure these kinds of fiery trials that come upon us? Peter is modeling it for us here. Earlier, he quoted a sermon of Jesus. Here, he quotes the Old Testament. Psalm 55, 22 says this, Cast all your burdens on the Lord, and he'll sustain you. Peter, when confronted with suffering, whether it's his or the church to which he speaks, he holds fast to the word of God. Because suffering is inevitable, but it is not the last word. If you would please, look down, verse 10, bottom paragraph. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory, will, and on and on. I was so impressed during the children's message this morning, and it happened last night as well, when Mr. Debrick asked the kids up front what they knew about Jesus. I, I was just honestly surprised. I was trying to, in the millisecond at when he asked that question last night, I was trying to predict what was going to come out of someone's mouth. I just assumed someone was going to say he was born on Christmas so that Santa can give me gifts. I heard none of that. I heard none of that. Did you hear the beautiful answers they gave? You know, one child said that Jesus died for our sins. One child who is very church year oriented said that Jesus ascended into heaven. That child knew just a few days ago we celebrated the ascension. One child said, and this was the first thing I heard last night too, this child said, Jesus, he rose from the dead. We're at the end of the season of Easter. And there's a couple things that I would love for you to know. If you were to only be reminded of one thing about the season of Easter, it should be this. Jesus who once was dead, he lives again. He who died for the sins of the world lives and reigns forevermore. Death has no power over him anymore. If you're going to remember one thing about the season of Easter, let it be that. Jesus lives. But if you have room in your head for a second thing, let it be this. You too Though you suffer for a little while, you too, even if you die, you will live again. There it is in black and white on the page. You see what it says in verse 10? You see what it says about suffering? It says that suffering is but a little while. But later in the verse, do you see what it says about glory? It says that glory is eternal. When we are in the midst of suffering, it can feel like everything. It can feel like an inescapable pit, but not so for the people of God. Because God claimed you as his own through simple water connected to his divine word. You are now linked to Jesus. You get the benefit of his suffering. You also get to look forward to his resurrection. The first thing we ought to remember about Easter day and Easter season is that Jesus lives. The next one is that you and I will live also, even after suffering, even after death. Jesus, who once was dead, lives and reigns forevermore. He has ascended to the right hand of his Father, where he intercedes on behalf of his church. 
And also he is coming again to set all things right and to deliver to his father a holy people. Not holy because of their comforts or because of their successes. Holy because they have been covered by his blood. Holy because he has bought them and covered their shame with his glorious righteousness. Holy because they belong to him. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now may the peace of God that far surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Stand. Yeah. 
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church here and scattered throughout the world, for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the sick and dying and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For Friar, Ann, and Larry, for Joe, for Russell, and Lisa, for family and friends of Robert and those we name in our hearts, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Finally, for these and for all of our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the spirit of truth whom you have promised from the Father, for you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen.